Okay, is this is this working? Okay, I think I see my mic on. Okay, cool. Um, hello, this is uh, Game Center Live. This is a new talk show that we are starting up here at NYU Game Center. Uh, NYU Game Center is in is right here in, in this in this cool building right here. Um, why'd you take a picture? It's okay. Um, so. Um, Today, uh, we have a bunch of special guests that we're going to talk to and hang out with. Uh, we are also going to be going over some important uh, game news as well as mundane school announcements if there are any students watching. Uh, so feel free to hang out for the next hour or two as I just make a huge fool of myself and try to be a TV host. We'll see how it goes. Uh, first off, uh, let's start with some announcements. Uh, so, uh, if you haven't heard, NYU Game Center has moved to a new building at 370 J Street. Uh, if you lived in the New York area and you visited us before at 2 Metro Tech, 370 J Street is just like a, f like a few blocks away. It's pretty close by. Uh, we're still under construction. It doesn't quite look like this yet, but don't worry, soon it will. Uh, next, um, other events that are going on here, uh, we have Playtest Thursday. Playtest Thursday is something we run every week, if you're not familiar. Uh, it's Thursday, 5.30 p.m., uh, 370 J Street, 6th floor. We have free pizza, and we encourage everyone, uh, not just students, but also everyone in the whole New York City games community to bring their games and playtest them, eat pizza, Everyone wins. It's win-win. Uh, this week, we are also hosting uh, Marie Fulston right after the Playtest Thursday at 7 p.m. That's tonight. Uh, if you haven't RSVP'd yet, make sure you definitely RSVP if you're planning on coming. Don't RSVP if you're not going to attend that that doesn't make any sense but um definitely rsvp because the room is a little bit on the smaller side so make sure you uh go to our website gamecenter.nyu.edu and sign up for that uh should be a fantastic talk and who knows maybe you'll get a preview of marie fulston later on in this broadcast who knows I know, I know actually. Um, okay, uh, other local events. Uh, the Wonder Bundle, uh, or Wonderville, is a local NYC area bar in Bushwick. Well, or in Ridgewood, depending on who you ask. But anyway, uh, they're running a big event tomorrow. Uh, I believe it starts at 8 p.m., I don't remember. Um, they are launching their Wonder Bundle, which was what they uh, did their whole Kickstarter around. Full disclosure, I also contributed a game to this bundle, but if you're 21 or older, feel free to go to this party tomorrow. Should be a really fun time. Uh, other events going on at Baby Castles, uh, our um, favorite DIY punk video game gallery over here in New York City. Uh, and Baby Castles, uh, they are running a new exhibition starting next Friday, I believe. Let me double check. Starting next Friday, that's the 27th. Uh, that's It's called The Year of the Pig, and it is celebrating uh, Chinese, mainland Chinese, Taiwanese, and Hong Kong game developers. Uh, and they are, uh, they all have games premiering here, games and installations, and it should be really fun. And uh, the tickets are pretty low cost, 5 to $15 on the sliding scale, depending on your ability to pay. And it should be really fun. It's right off the Union Square stop or a 6 Ave uh, L stop. Make sure you go to Baby Castles next week. Should be really fun. Um, other announcements, um, GDC Summit submissions are actually closing pretty soon at the end of this month. So if you want to get some kind of uh, GDC submission in. This is kind of your last chance in the next two weeks. 
Uh, if you're not familiar, the GDC summits are like mini conference tracks. They're separate from like the main tracks. So there's like ones for like AI, there's stuff for graphics or, uh, or my favorite is level design or um, there's plenty of different tracks. There's over 20 different summits. So uh, if you want to submit something to GDC, make sure you actually start now too because the form is like super long. It's like thousands of words. So if you want to submit to GDC, do it now. Um, another call for submissions, uh, QGCon is a queerness in games conference. Uh, they are about diversity and inclusion in games, and they are running up at uh, Concordia University, Montreal, not too far from New York City. And uh, QGCon is actually looking for submissions. And uh, I believe uh, the... The submissions are open until October 15th, so make sure you take advantage of that if you want to submit, uh, whether it's like a talk or a workshop idea, uh, visit QGCon.com and make your submissions. Um, then just some last few student uh, announcements that are really important. Uh, help desks, specifically code help desks, have been expanded every weekday 1 to 5 p.m. So if you need help with Game Maker stuff or Unity stuff, make sure you go to this help desk um, so that you can get the help you need. You don't have to suffer in silence. Just go to the help desk, sit down, and there'll be a very qualified, excellent person who can be there to help you with your Game Maker Unity projects. Some of them can even help you with your JavaScript stuff or some of them even know some shader stuff. So definitely check that out. Um, other school stuff going on. Uh, if you haven't heard, the global climate strike is happening next week. Um, actually, no, starting tomorrow. It's not next week. I mean, it's going on more next week. Uh, but starting tomorrow, the global climate strike is starting. Uh, if you are a student and you intend to participate in the strike, make sure you talk to your instructor and make alternate arrangements. Maybe you can get your absence excused so that you can participate in the strike. Uh, as we all know, climate change and the climate crisis are really important issues of our time. So it's totally okay if you want to participate, but make sure you communicate with everyone first about it. Um, I believe it's starting at Foley Square in the morning in Lower Manhattan, and then uh, they're marching up through Manhattan, ending at Bryant Park around the early afternoon, where uh, climate activist Greta Thunberg will also be giving a speech. So it should be really fun if you like really crowded spaces where you're stuck on the street and then you can't pee and you just have to stand there. It's really, really fun. Go to a protest march in NYC. It's super fun. Um, other stuff, what's he doing? Um, other stuff uh, going on is Anything But Games. Uh, Anything But Games is a proud Game Center tradition going on tomorrow at, I believe, 5 p.m. in room 626. Anything But Games is where different members of the Game Center community hang out and talk about basically anything other than games. And if you mention games, it's really fun. Everyone gets to go, boo, games. Uh, so it's super fun. Make sure you attend and hang out with the rest of your classmates and teachers and everyone. Um, another important announcement for Game Center students, uh, uh, elections, or actually I should say nominations for student reps are open. So please make sure you nominate uh, whether it's yourself or a friend you know who would be super qualified to be a student rep. Uh, make sure you nominate them um, because student reps are an important part of the whole governance system here at NYU Game Center. Um, the student rep is the main person who voices uh, student concerns or complaints or compliments, student compliments are nice too, uh, to the rest of the department and faculty. So it's partly how you hold the faculty and the staff kind of accountable to what the student body wants and needs. So make sure you take this student rep stuff pretty seriously because it's how you get stuff. And then lastly, just to end our announcements, uh, make sure you follow us 
on um, on our website, on Facebook, on Twitter. We're on NYU Game Center on Twitter and on YouTube. We are NYU Game Center. Um, should be pretty easy to find, honestly. Uh, our YouTube is especially really cool and, in my opinion, an underutilized resource where we have literally like over 100 talks by famous, important, influential game industry thinkers and developers. So make sure you check out our YouTube. We have a lot of good stuff on there. Uh, okay, that's all the announcements. How long did that take? That took like 10 minutes, right? Okay. Um, next, uh, let's move on to news. Um, so uh, joining me for news will be my amazing co-host, Naomi Cork. I'm behind. Oh, no. Wait, let me change this. <laughs> oh, wait, that's our Twitch screen. Oops, let me change that, too. That's weird. Um, so, uh, something I thought would be fun is if we also covered, like, typical game industry news or important game industry news going on, uh, and then offer our snide, snarky commentary, uh, to accompany that news so that you know what to think, because you should think whatever we tell you to think. Yeah, that's of what course. professors are for, right? We just sort of indoctrinate you. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Although usually we, you know, keep it out on the down low, right? We don't usually say that out loud. Um, but uh, first off uh, is a very interesting um, student opinion section on the New York Times. And New York Times is asking, are video games bad? What do you think, Naomi? Are video games bad? It's a really complicated subject. Uh, like anything, there may be bad and good. I'm, I'm interested that the New York Times is still kind of on this tip that you know if you talk to people who write about games for a living or or think about games of course they'll they'll say yeah what well, this is a funny question to ask of course some of them are bad and some of them are good uh the new york times is still stuck in an era where they feel like probably most of their readership is thinking games are awful uh and so it's interesting for them to put up an op-ed uh, and let's be clear so this this thing that we're showing on the screen is a student curriculum uh with a set of questions do you think games are bad F uh, about an op-ed that was published on sunday um, by eve pacer uh and i guess when reading this my impression was this is like the op-ed version of that lana del rey song about video games where video games are sort of a prop uh in a lifestyle uh, setting, right? And it's like, oh, my boyfriend plays so many video games. Maybe I could play them with him. <laughs> what would happen if I did that, right? And so it's this, it's a story about a couple that decides to play video games. And they're playing like Earth Defense Force and GTA. She's like, oh, they're so violent and gory. Uh, and so kind of missing from this picture is the idea that there are any other types of video games that, that maybe both people would want to play equally or that there are women who might be playing video games and maybe they're playing different games than their their partners but how do you find a game that you want to play with with your partner it is a challenge i think you know that game designers have as well but this particular op-ed is all about well there's one non-gamer and obviously it's the woman in the heterosexual relationship right so it is sort of like a uh a straights problem kind of thing i don't know how do you find games that that you want to play with your partner I'm just so glad that I have a husband, which means I can play video games. If you don't have a boyfriend, you cannot play video games, yeah, well, as we all know. All, all like all games. Both of you like every game because you're both guys. Yeah. Whereas uh, in in my relationship, we we just don't play any games at all. Yeah, because we we <laughs> both are women and we both hate games. Of course, of course. It's it's really great that the New York Times could help us clear all this up. Um, really makes me feel good about the future. But, but there's a happy ending. This was the Eve, the pacer, the writer, discovers she's like, oh, actually, it's really fun to shoot giant bugs in Earth Defense Force or to play a amoral version of herself in GTA. So I guess the, the message is uh, anybody can like AAA video games. <laughs> even me. <laughs> even you. What? Wow. Let's go to the next news news article. Oh, IndieCade. Yeah, so the IndieCade has uh, announced its nominees. 
we're really excited here at NYU because there are a bunch of games that were worked on as, at NYU that are in the mix. Uh, a couple, for instance, from uh, MFA students who just graduated, uh, including uh, a game called Hell Couch, where you summon a demon with your butt by sitting on an actual couch. So th that will, I, I, it's got to be somewhere in there, right? Uh, there is also another game from um, some of the same designers called, called Chroma, an abstract uh, board game. And uh, uh, a puzzle game called Moncage, which is uh, uh, about perspective and seeing things from a different point of view and has some, yeah, some like really tricky puzzly elements that are all about lining the camera up correctly. I can't find any of them. Yeah, they might not all be on, on the page we're looking at, but um, I promise you these are all nominated. And also actually a, a thesis pro. Oh, there's Moncage, yeah. So a thesis game from a, a couple years ago, or a collection of games, um, about intimacy uh, that are role-playing games for two to four people. Some of them are live action. Uh, that uh, intimacy collection is also going to be featured in Indiecade. Uh, that's by um, uh, MFA graduate uh, Karan Cole. Yeah. Go on to the next one. Ooh, Apple Arcade. Yes, that is launching. What is it launching today? Is it the 19th? Yeah, today is Apple or today's Apple Arcade launch day. So you would think this would be some sort of enormous event in the game industry, but I'm honestly not sure it, it is. What's what's your take on Apple Arcade? Um, I have a lot of like friends, and I know people launching a whole bunch of games. Um, but yeah, I don't know what the actual like word on the street is. Right, we might have to add a segment to this program where we go out on the street somehow. Just ask random New Yorkers. We we just asked them. We were like, "Oh, so have you signed up for Apple Arcade?" No. Right. So they don't they don't know what Apple Arcade is. <laughs> so we can sort of just simulate that. Um, that's kind of the question that's on everyone's mind. It's like like who is actually going to sign up for Apple Arcade? Nobody seems to know. The game industry pundits aren't sure. Um, game developers don't know. I think um, we we do actually have some colleagues here at the Game Center who have a game. Uh, there's a game called Dear Reader. It's in the sort of first 50 titles that are launching today. You can you can check it out if you pay the five dollar a month subscription price, right? Uh, and there's a bunch of other like yeah, pretty big names. The creators of Monument Valley, um, the what is it? The the studio by a former um, Final Fantasy Square Enix. Uh, creative head, oh, oh Mistwalker yeah. Studio, yeah. right? Yeah, oh, Sayonara Wild Hearts. That's also fr from um, oh. Samogo, the creators oh, right. of Device Six. Uh, yeah, so you're you're seeing like, uh, yeah, new updated. Well, this is Mini Motorways from the creators of Mini Metro. So Apple is really trying to get a lot of recognizable names and faces, both to people who like play JRPGs as well as mobile game hits. But who are they trying to target? Um, it's just not quite certain who's going to pay five dollars a month for this. Do you, do you have uh, subscriptions to game services like this? Um, we got Apple Arcade, but mostly just because we were making games for Apple Arcade, <laughs> so that's why yeah. we got an Apple TV so we could make games for the Apple TV. But how about for platforms you don't develop for? Um, for platforms I don't develop for, um, yeah, I guess we got the PS4 right. subscription. But Nintendo other than Switch that, online? do you have Nintendo Switch Online? No. No, right. So I think there, there's a couple categories, right? So there are these the console online services. People have them. I'm gonna say mostly so that they can play multiplayer games, right? So because you can't go online and play with other people unless you subscribe to this, and then you get some games as an extra bonus. Do you ever um, play any of the games that are available? I think temporarily for free from the the PlayStation online service. Oh no, it's permanent. I think. Oh, is it, you just get them. Yeah, it's like you get like one or two games for free. Um, please sponsor us, Sony. Uh, yeah, you only get like you get one or two games for free, but they're usually kind of like old games that are probably way in their long tail. And then Sony signs a deal with them to like pay them like pennies per copy. Subscribe. Right. So it's kind of a, a bonus. I, I have this service. I didn't even know that you could get them permanently or I would have been downloading them. So that's one category. We know why people have has subscribed to that. It's so that they can play with other people online. Then there are other online game services that just haven't done very well. Like actually Twitch just canceled theirs, I think. Oh gosh. Yeah, they had a they, they decided I, I that's what I heard at least. Oh, I'm sorry, not Twitch. I think it was Discord. 
You're right. It's Discord. Discord is the one that just shut down um, because they also had a s subscribe and get games kind of service. But it's not clear whether these things are going to work. There's this fantasy that some people have of what if I could have a Netflix for games, right, where I don't have to decide what to buy. I just sign on and there are just all these games there for free. Um, what do you think? Is that going to ever going to work? Um. No, I don't think I don't think I like the idea of Google Stadia and stuff like that. I don't know if it's going to work. Personally. Do we even know how Google Stadia is working? Is it going to be a subscription service? Have they announced that? I think no. Yeah. So it, it's coming in November, which is just like a you know a month and a half away. But uh, we still don't know how that's going to work. And Apple, I think, has tried to get out of the gate in front of them. Um, the, these people are talking about this stuff all over the industry, but. So far, I think the conventional wisdom of is this really benefits people who are gonna who are getting in on the ground floor. Like we're really happy and excited for all the developers who are in Apple Arcade because all of those diehard Apple fans who jump on everything that Apple ever does, they're all gonna be like, I'm paying five dollars. They're gonna play those games and it's gonna be exciting. Plus, here's here's some inside scoop. I'm probably violating some sort of NDA here, but I didn't sign anything, so I don't care. Um, all the developers who are in this initial pool of fifty. They uh, there's a, a pot of money that Apple's already set aside for them, and depending on how, I think I think it's depending on how many people play their game, they are going to get just a chunk of that pot. So how much their game is played does matter, but it's not actually coming from the five dollar subscription revenue. Apple's already sort of set it aside. So the lesson for this, students and everyone else, and who knows, I might actually have that wrong. So yeah, come yeah, just come at me, Apple lawyers. It's fine. The, um, I'm a professor. That's where we're here to, to do this kind of thing. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the lesson is get in as one of the launch titles. You'll make money. Everyone after you, out of luck. Thank okay. You. <laughs> um, let's move on to this. Oh, I can intro Yeah, this go one. for it. Um, okay, so some other news. Um, uh, this is a piece over at The Verge uh, about how two big streamers, uh, Ninja and Tifu, have uh, gone off Twitch for whatever reason. Ninja signed a deal. Tifu just got needed a break from streaming, I believe. Um, but what's interesting is that when you have giant cults of personality mode around these games, um, it actually kind of affects the weird like bottom line about like Twitch rankings and Twitch trackers and what people are playing. Um, so it's just interesting to me about how um, the these the like people like gravitate around these figures and like follow them in a in a way, or um, or how these games are tied to people, or how people are tied to games as well. Does this mean that Fortnite's actually making less money because Ninja and Tifu aren't streaming it? Um, we can only hope. I mean, I didn't say that. I meant um, maybe. That's what I meant. I'm really curious about that because that would be huge. The conventional wisdom about games, especially online games, is that they are sticky. That's why business people like them, right? Like people get sucked into them and then they're like, oh, now I have a habit. I log into World of Warcraft to play with my friends every day. And theoretically, the same would be true of Minecraft or Fortnite or whatever. But if it's really much more driven from moment to moment, day to day, uh, by streamers, that would be a massive change. Mm -hmm. Definitely. We have to move on with the news stuff. Yeah, yeah. Our next forward. guest is getting antsy. Um, so other stuff going on. Uh, this is from RPS, uh, Rock Paper Shotgun. And this is an uh, article about how Rockstar is launching their own launcher. And to launch their own launcher, they're giving you one of the older Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas, or whatever, for free. That's probably one of the better ones, actually. Um, so they're launching their own thing. And the rumor on the street is that this is to set up their own Steam alternative for when they launch uh, their cowboy game sequel. Um, what? Red, Red Dead Redemption Online? or uh, no, two. It's already, it's, it's already uh, for PC. They haven't launched oh, it PC for PC, version. I believe. Oh, so this is a PC. This is a PC game launcher. Yes. Right. So this is just another salvo in the ongoing war against Steam. Uh, everybody is cropping up, and you know, like Google is going to be sort of joining the fray soon too with Stadia. Uh, to everybody's chipping away at that almost monopoly that Steam has, and this is making people furious with Epic, right? So. Uh, have you seen any of the direction of people like furious about yet another launcher popping up or is it too soon? Um, it might be too soon to tell yet, um, partly because 
I don't know, they gave you a free game, I guess. But um, also word on the street with this launcher, though, is that it actually does offer features unlike the Epic Game Store. Uh, this one does have like cloud saving and stuff like that. So it does maybe improve your gaming experience or something. Right, because that's what people really want in their game experience is the good launcher features. Um, Around here, I think where our opinion of these launchers is probably driven mostly by, is it good for developers, especially smaller developers, or not? I'm thinking if I had to put a bet, I would say probably having more launchers out there in an environment where they're competing against each other is slightly better for developers than an environment which is totally dominated by Steam. So I've been noticing with fascination like how many players are really mad about this actually even bennett foddy was a little bit mad like he really is attached to his steam collection he said this on twitter publicly so uh yeah and it's it's like i'm one of these people that I, I do not get it like i don't care what i launcher i'm launching my game from but some people are really attached to it this is why i think a netflix of games won't work because can you imagine like you subscribing to a launcher and then you can only play the games that are in that launcher that would like the people who are mad about having to download a store to buy a game how much more mad will they be if they're like oh can i get the latest such and such game and it's not in their subscription service they have to subscribe to a different one that's what you have to do with tv shows right now right but and if that happened with games like i don't know those people's brains would melt i think developer wise one other angle or hot take on this is that as like a solo indie developer, it's like annoying to negotiate all these different contracts and deals with all these things. Um, so if we see um, a wider range of stores, I mean, that's good for competition, but it will also mean in the indie sector, you're going to see a lot more people like group up into like mini studios or get more publishers just because the overhead of getting your game any distribution will require you to talk to 10 different platforms in the future maybe, right? Right. Yeah, it's a huge pain in the neck. I mean, including with Apple and mobile platforms too. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, the looming question behind all of this is who has the bargaining power in this situation? Okay, yeah. should we wrap up news or what do you think? Um, we had a bunch of news items, but I think we should just cut those short and maybe bring in our stream. All right. Well, I'm so this is me signing off, Naomi Clark. Uh, maybe I'll return for news in the future. Yes, please. Thanks, Naomi. Bye. Okay, and now uh, we have our we have a new guest coming in. Um, this uh, so every week in our broadcast, we also want to make sure that uh, we like highlight our uh, local game center community. So every week, we want to do some kind of like student profile, ideally. So our first student profile is here. Hello, hi, Robert. Hey. Thank you no problem. Uh, this is. Do you want to introduce yourself and talk sure. about yourself a little? Um, I'm Emily Kuntz. I am a senior in game design. This is actually my last semester because I'm graduating early. Um, so I've been in this program since I was a freshman, and I've primarily focused on studying the type of play in games that are uh, like folk games and what circumstances and conditions are conducive to making house rules and a lot of community play uh but i've also made a lot of digital games and uh, all over the place trying everything this program has to offer out so <laughs> it's been fun um so yeah i'm excited to be here cool um do you have any like um favorite classes that you um, like especially or any like favorite assignments or projects, you know, just to sell, you know, just to give the viewers at home a little taste of what it would be like to be a student here at Game Center. Well, I think the most useful class I've taken was definitely tackling representation in games with Maddie Bryce, which was excellent. It's about, it's essentially like how to design ethically because it's like how does it, what you're representing in your games and your systems, like how does it reflect the world and what effect does it have on people and culture? And so that was definitely the most formative in like of my practice because I'd never thought about those things before. 
um, I came into this program being like, oh, I just want to make something fun. And then I <laughs> I learned that it was much deeper too. than that. Yeah, That's which good too. it is good too. Well, and you could do both at the same time, um, which is something I've learned. And I, I hope that I continue to get better at because I think I definitely have since I've started coming here. Um, my favorite project or like my favorite moment, I was in uh, narrative design with Clara and we had to we did an assignment in class where we made a larp and uh it, it took us like 20 minutes and our class decided that everyone was going to be a different bird and the whole the larp was that you have to find your bird soulmate so we ran around the game center and we all everyone had a different bird in like a bird call and, and you had to like... yeah you had to flap your wings and do your bird call and find your other bird soulmate and we got in a lot of trouble from the floor manager but it was really fun. We interrupted a lot of classes, but it was really fun. And it was a pretty fun LARP. I want to go play it at a park. <laughs> but it was, it, it's, I don't know, we, it's, it's wild on this floor. It's a good time. <laughs> um, oh. um, yeah, I mean, it's always good to be a bird, bring out your inner bird. Um, and you know, it's, well, it's not that okay to get the department in trouble with yeah. the floor, but but you know what? It's okay. You're a student. Students can try new things, and <laughs> we're pushing boundaries. Innovation, 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 innovation. That's the I word we're going to yeah. be using here. Um, okay, so uh, up on the screen here, I have um, or up on the screen here, uh, I have one of your games. Um, uh, do you want to intro it sure. while I play a little bit? Uh, so this game was made for a class we have called Pixel Prototype, which is currently taught by Bennett Foddy, and we use Pico 8 to make games. Every week has a different theme. So this week's theme, in which I made this game, was crowds. Um, so yeah, this is Keg Beg, and it's essentially about being at a frat party and trying to get oh, everyone's... <laughs> yeah, you got it. You got a boy. <laughs> You're trying to get... Oh, no. They ran away. So <laughs> basically the idea behind this prototype was I wanted to explore like I because I like attention. A lot of people like attention and I wanted to see like the mechanics of being in a group of people and trying to get everyone to listen to you tell a story or talk and how when you lose your social graces in this game, which is representative of stuttering by running into one of the various uh ums or ers uh then everyone runs away from you and you oh, lose all that no. attention <laughs> it's pretty hard to keep everyone's attention turns out um but yeah so i wanted to see like what the mechanics are of like losing your social graces and trying to maintain this un like unsustainable resource of other people's undivided time and attention and so this game is about the <laughs> running around and trying to do just that. Do you want to show me how it's done? I mean, what's your what what's what high score have you gotten on this game? Not very far. <laughs> not very high. If you see, like, since they're going back and forth on the screen, you kind of want to acquire people to your right and left rather than up and down. Um, and then you'll have a better chance of not running into anything, but it's pretty hard because once you you've gotten enough attention, you just keep getting more. This is just like real life. Yeah. This is extremely <laughs> realistic. This is ex this is my experience with every kegger I've been to at a frat party, which NYU. <laughs> yeah, how many how many keggers have what? <laughs> Does NYU, I mean, the no, NYU, NYU, NYU has frats. I went to one frat party and it's, they're at like clubs and they're all like way too crowded, but you go out to the, I'm from the Midwest. So the, <laughs> the frat parties in the Midwest are a little different than the frat parties at NYU. I, have to. I mean, yeah, more of like a campus yeah, feeling, right? Yeah, more sure. of a Greek row. Um, cool. Oh, wait. Oh, okay. The party is over. Only zero people can stand you. Uh oh. We didn't do too hot, no, did we? we? Didn't do too well. um, you know, it's it's hard to it's hard to get the boys, right? Yeah, it is hard to get the boys, <laughs> especially at the NYU frat parties. <laughs> um, we love you, NYU frats. Um, 
Uh, let's try some warrior yeah, games. How about right. that? Uh, I've got one in mind for you to play, Robert. Uh, so I'm just going to go to your Twitch page. Sounds good. Go to Pivot. Yes. Okay. Which I've been working on this, and I posted it on it just so you could play it. Oh, wait, I mean... You can, yeah, just okay. make it uh, full screen on. Yeah, there. Okay, there. there. So um, the orientation is because I want this to eventually be a mobile game. This is something I started working on on my own outside of a class. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> so once you get the hang of it, yeah, it's just right and left. Um, yeah, so this was, I think, the first game I ever, uh, you can just press and oh. continue. Um, the f first game I ever made, like, outside of a class, a uh, digital game I ever made outside of a class, um, just for fun. And it turns out a lot of people, there's a lot of reactions to this game. You're doing pretty well. Walk me through the reactions. Oh my god. Um, oh my god. Oh my some god. People, <laughs> oh, oh. So some people, it's really hard for them to get, because you're, you're rotating. You press right and left and you rotate whatever direction you press. And so that's a really hard thing for some people to like get the feeling of mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Some people have told me it's like riding a bicycle the more they do it. But a lot of people who play this game will like get really determined to beat it and will just start memorizing exactly what to press. Um, so <laughs> I'll try one more time. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going try as much as you want. Uh, it's <laughs> Wait, can you sh can you can you show me how it's done? Yeah. Can the master teach the pupil? Okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah, sorry it's in the way. Oh. There's a, there's a pole in the way. I'm really good at this game, I swear. Yeah, Emily's really good at her own game. It's not, it's because I have all this lighting equipment in front of the screen. Okay, so. Oh my god, you're so good. Okay. So good. Keep going. Yes, please. Oh. I oh. can definitely get past this level. The next level, I've only beat one. <laughs> You've only beat it. Oh my god. Well, I'm still, I, as I develop the levels, I obviously beat them once to make sure they're beatable. But some, the people who are really good at this, um, like the really hard levels and people who don't pick it up right away I really think I should stop after the first like three. <laughs> but it's just a... I love like the arcade feel of this. Um, like, I don't know, like this could totally work on a phone, right? Have that's, you thought? That's why that's in this orientation because I think I want it to be a mobile game because it's one of those that you just like want to keep playing and get till you keep going to perfect it. It's all about the portrait orientation, yeah, right? That portrait orientation, baby. Really? No landscape. Boo, Boo, landscape. We hate landscape. It's all about portrait. On a subway, portrait is preferable. I, I really have to, really have to say. Oh, you can go the other yeah, way. Yeah, you can go the different way. Oh. So I, I made it like I've been debating on if I want to keep it. Um, so you can like diverge like this. But I think it it helps you from getting burnt out. Both ways are like pretty equal in difficulty, in my opinion. Some people think that one will be more than the other. Um, oh, oh, we should go. Oh. oh, should we play one more? Um, do you have more games? I have, you yeah, I have okay. one more though. I'm ready for you to play. Okay. So. We got pretty far though. We did get pretty far. There's one more level if anyone wants to try it at any point on my edge. So that was called oh, yeah. Pivot, right? Pivot. All right, now go to the child. So this game was inspired by Friedrich Nietzsche, which I know you have a lot of experience. You've lectured on Nietzsche. You've read a lot of Nietzsche. Wait, how about so, yes, I guess. Um, so you can go ahead. Okay, so walk us through this while I play um, so this was inspired by uh, Nietzsche's uh, Ubermensch. Oh, you're pretty good at it. <laughs> so. So that in the Ubermensch um, or the Overman, in English translation, um, Nietzsche talks about the three stages of being people can accomplish. The first is the camel. Um, which was the previous stage with which Robert beat pretty quickly. Uh, this is the stage of the lion. And once you beat the lion, there's a final stage. 
How do I choose the one? I mean, that's the question. Oh. Wait, so walk me through, like, what does the lion mean? So, in, uh, in this passage, the way I, I interpret it, at least, um, the camel is what is is the stage of life that we all are born into and we grow up and we're told all these things we have to do we're told the way we should see the world we're told what success means how we should be living and we most people according to Nietzsche like 99% of people remain in the camel phase of their whole life they do things for the sake of what society tells them and not for the sake of themselves so eventually, if you start critiquing these forces that are telling you what to do, right. you... Right. How do I stop climbing? Oh, you're uh, still climbing. I'm still climbing. You're still climbing. climbing. You gotta... F oh? oh! Okay, so I escaped the lion, and now what's this stage? Now you are the child. The last stage. Um, so yeah, essentially we're camels and then eventually we realize the, the all these forces upon us and when we realize them, we start saying no to them. So we turn into the lion and we say no to everything we're supposed to do and doing things for the sake of what people tell us to do. And we stop doing everything that society tells us we must. But then eventually, because after saying no to all these things, you have to start to say yes to something. So once you start doing that and you start doing things for the sake of yourself, you turn into the child. And the child just does things that they, I'm, I'm trying to learn Nietzsche yeah. <laughs> straight through this game, straight through you repeating it. So, so the child does what they want. Is that it? The, the, yeah, the child has, oh, oh this is like, wonder about them where they're interested and curious in all these things for the sake in themselves so the child does do what they want so essentially this game is about not following the directions i <laughs> give you and the the like visual symbols i'm trying to make you like manipulate you by doing so the first stage if you want to play it again oh, um i didn't know yeah, I was you, speeding you beat it, it super fast some people do, some people don't. So do you see the instructions? If you follow the instructions, try. You have to stay on the ladder. You slowly inch your way up the ladder. Oh. That's hard. Yeah, it's really hard. Wait, how did I beat it? How did I beat it? Do you remember how you beat it? See if you can beat it again. Oh, wait, didn't I just press up? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so the first stage is about saying no to what everyone tells you to do, saying no to this mechanic of climbing and climbing to the moon in this case. And we got our little camel in the corner to remind you of that. And then you're the lion, so you find you said no to this, and you it says stop climbing, but you keep climbing no matter what you do. So you, you'll climb and climb until you eventually decide to go a different direction where you become the child. I think we're making Nietzsche proud. Yeah, <laughs> yes. We're making games. And we're also making we're also making Charles Pratt proud yeah. by invoking <laughs> Nietzsche's name, I think. Good. I'm I'm glad. I am minoring in philosophy, oh. so I had to I had to throw a little philosophy into some of my games. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks. Do you have more games to show, or um, do you think we're good? I, I think we're pretty good. We, we, <laughs> okay. No, we're good, we're good. Um, well, our, I don't see our special guest yet, so do you want to hang out a little bit longer? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think what we'll do now is we're going to go back to some of the news items that we didn't catch before, Ooh, and you can right. offer some of your commentary, maybe. So exciting. Uh, okay, let me see. Uh, what's this one? What's this one? Oh, okay. So, um, so this is a story that 
in Kotaku, um, where apparently, like, all across the internet, like, Nintendo made, like, a new cartoon bird. And then everyone was looking at this cartoon bird and just collectively lost their shit about this cartoon bird. Um, Birds are important. We've already established that. Birds are, you gotta be a bird sometimes. But, like, (laughs) are we really a bird? When we're the Pokemon trainer, we're not the bird. We're, like, trapping this bird inside this ball. Mystery dungeon. Then we could be the bird. True enough. (laughs) I mean, yep, mystery dungeon's good. Um, but if we scroll down, you will see that um, people are trying to like meme about this bird a lot. Um, people are like really thirsty for this bird too. It also seems. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe some of this isn't appropriate for Twitch. I don't know. We might get we might get banned for some of these images, like like not even wearing clothes. Right? It's a yeah, naked bird. A naked bird. Oof. Um, a, a leaf, a leaf shield. Yeah, do you play a lot of Pokemon? Yeah, I far fetched. Well, I, I'm used to like I played a lot when I was younger, so I'm way more familiar with the earlier generations. And of the first and second generation, actually, my brother has a ton of Pokemon figures, and so me and my cousins used to play with the figures a ton, almost more than the actual games. Um, and far fetched was one of the figures that I insisted on having every time. So seeing. This little far-fetched baby, Sir-fetched, is that its name? Yeah, I think so. It's it's bringing you back. <laughs> it's it's bringing me back. I don't know. I, I far-fetched is so dear to me though. But Sir-fetched looks so big compared to far-fetched in some of these <laughs> pictures. It's so big. That bird is just so big. <laughs> so oh my I, god. Yeah, I might far-fetched might lose his crown. <laughs> I can sympathize. I can sympathize with the internet right now. I'm sure your brother will recover. (laughs) Um, Okay, good. Uh, Let's uh, cover some other news articles I was seeing around. So um, let's see. Uh, This one. Uh, This is a new report from GameDaily.biz, which I've actually never heard of, but this was the source I found. They have an exclusive source that E3 2020, if you're not familiar, E3 is like a big me- uh, video game industry, like media event that happens in LA over the summer. Um, E3 2020 um, is proposing an overhaul of how they're doing things where um, instead of doing stuff about like, um, instead of like catering more to like developers and stuff, it, they're going to also rebrand as specifically an influencer festival Whoa. so they're gonna be bringing out fire fest. fire fest <laughs> they're gonna bring <laughs> <laughs> fire fest 2 e3 let's all go to an island and like eat like <laughs> what what they do they like eat like bread yeah they gave they like didn't have any water or food <laughs> they, they just gave them like there's a picture of like the worst sandwich in the world and that was like all they had for like two days they kept giving them free drinks though that was the one thing they did have was alcohol so we can all just go to E3 and not drink water yeah. Get drunk. <laughs> Talk about surfetched. That's the dream, right? You know, I think that actually is the plan. Oh, and look at all these exclusive secret blueprints or whatever that we're not supposed to see. Oh my god. Look at this leak. And then here's someone offering a hot take on Twitter that uh Gamescom, which is the biggest like PR kind of games event uh over in Germany. Um that's like the one of the biggest ones in the world, but and that has like three more than three hundred and seventy thousand viewers that says but or attendees, but E three only has like sixty six thousand attendees now. Um so what do you think? Are you gonna go to E three? If it's anything like Firefest, I'll be there. <laughs> I'll be I'll be ready. Well Firefest was also really expensive, right? Yeah, Firefest was really I think that was that was the the whole thing was that these people paid so much money to go on this like beautiful vacation and then it turned out to be like people <laughs> were like dehydrated and fighting for food and in beds. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I, I'm all for like watching YouTubers suffer on yeah, camera. That would at be E three. Watching you what suffering at E three is a whole different type of suffering than at Firefest. <laughs> It'd be a whole new game. It'd give me a game changer. 
Very true. I think Nietzsche would have a lot to yeah. say about E3, right? <laughs> yeah, I think he would. Uh, okay, let's move on to some more news items. Is our guest out there? No. Okay. Um, let's move on to some more news items. Um, let's see. Um, oh. Um, so this is a news item that I picked out. Um, from it's kind of going around uh, European ga- uh, indie Twitter right now. Uh, this is from uh, Games Wirtschaft, and it says uh, a Maze Festival 2020. If you're not familiar, a Maze is one of the best game festivals around. Have you ever been to a Maze? No, my roommate went to a Maze last year though, and he loved it. Uh, what did your roommate say? Uh, what What was so cool about it? just like a lot like chiller it was wasn't as like uh networky as some other festivals he's been to so he really enjoyed it right uh amaze is like the opposite of e3 kind of right um it happens in berlin berlin is super cool berlin is you know it's like the new new york you know new york sucks you know it's all about berlin now although i hear, hear berlin's over too um but some really Serious news happening is that um, according to Games Wirtschaft, uh, let's see if my German's okay. Keine Zuschuss uh, uh, der Berliner Senatsverwaltung, which is uh, the Berlin Cultural Congress or Senate or whatever council, cultural council, uh, has denied additional funding to a maze 2020, which means it might not happen anymore. Oh, that's pretty disappointing. I wanted to go at one point. <laughs> that's that's such a shame, though, because it seems like everyone who goes really loves it. Marie, who's here with us, like has been amazed when she was lived in Berlin, and she was telling me about how amazing it is and how like great she lived. It was like one of the highlights of her time in Berlin. So I, it seems like the community there like really loves it and depends on it. So that's that, that's really bad news. Yeah, it's kind of messed up too, right? Um, what was what was the Berlin Cultural Senate, uh, Senate Verwaltung? Um, what were they thinking, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, I people people just don't value games <laughs> the way they used to, I guess. Whippersnapper. <laughs> yeah, back in the day when I was young. <laughs> um, yeah, although it is an interesting contrast to actually the U.S. landscape where um, the prospect of the city funding games is actually very rare. Like, at least they had the, at least they could apply for money. Here in the U.S., it's actually really hard to apply for money from, like, any kind of like city or municipal thing because they'll be like video games why do you need money for that yeah i i've never tried to apply to my my city for for money for a game because i didn't even know that was something that can happen that's a cool resource that i wish was more widespread and because we'd probably get cooler games and cooler games in which because my whole big things like community involvement um that community communities of people could engage with with their friends and their family in like a public space which would be super cool but (laughs) yeah it's a huge shame um i wish i knew a i wish i knew a very fitting german expression to express anguish and shame but i don't know any right now oh well if you have any just suggest some in the chat you know (laughs) Um, and I'll gladly try to pronounce it. Um, okay, some more news. Uh, is Marie out there? No. Okay. Um, some more news items. Yeah, maybe. Um, so, um, oh, this is kind of interesting. So this is a report from Rock Paper Shotgun. Um, it's talking about how uh, the in the UK Parliament they have uh, made a suggestion to the game industry that the game industry needs to start taking problem gaming more seriously and problem gaming uh i guess they define as kind of like all the loot box stuff going on all the slot machine stuff going on um where a lot of game mechanics and monetization stuff looks kind of similar to like gambling and then we're marketing these games towards children and also these children watch their favorite youtube personalities or favorite twitch personalities you know, um, uh, gamble and like have so much fun with loot boxes. And then that makes children want to do loot boxes and stuff too. Um, so this is just a really interesting article that's trying to unpack what it means for, 
um, a lot more uh, this like type of loot box legislation or how do we legalize it or how do we think about this stuff? So um, what are your thoughts about loot boxes or gambling or money in games? Well, ideally, we would have a, <laughs> we would have designers who understand how these systems affect the people who are engaging with them. Um, and would design with that in mind, which is not to perpetuate problematic things like gambling addiction or um, intrigue, but it doesn't <laughs> in gambling intrigue as we all, because our next segment, me and Robert are gonna play some poker. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, why not? You yeah, know, we could. Just it, you know? um, but I, that would be the ideal situation is that we're all as designers educated to how these things affect people because that's the people creating these things is what it comes down to. But it, since games are in an economy, um, in game economy, out, out of the in game economy in the real world economy, um, I think there's a lot of other intentions of designers when designing these things trying to get money out of vulnerable people and so i i always hesitate to promote like regulation of any kind because it it can be limiting and i sometimes i think it can have adverse effects but if that's <laughs> the capitalist uh, like systems that are making these games i maybe i'm not sure how do you feel i think that's totally right i think it's really important that we study these things and take them seriously because games do like affect us right that's like one central premise behind making a whole game design department right that mm -hmm. games are important culture and media and they're worth uh funding they're worth supporting so um we shouldn't just say games don't affect people this other way. It, games never do anything bad, right? That's kind of naive and silly. If we're saying games do so much good in the world and games are so important to us and we can play games with our boyfriends and stuff, mm -hmm. right? We should also say, no, what if games can also corrupt our boyfriends too and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, Media Studies 101 with Robert Yang. Media Studies 101 <laughs> with Robert Yang. Um, anyway, uh, our special guest is here, so I'm going to boot you out, yeah. unfortunately. Bye. Hi, thank you for having me again. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Emily. <clears throat> um, okay, uh, our next uh, our next guest is uh, someone who you'll be seeing shortly at our lecture series, and someone who I hinted might appear earlier during our announcements, and that is Marie Fulston. Marie. Um, hello, Marie. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I feel like I'm a bit in at the deep end, so. Um, what do you mean by, what do you mean by deep end? This is so. Straight onto camera, like bang, in you go, into the newsroom, so. You know, that's how we do it. We're all New York, we're in your face. We just, we're also low budget. We're also, <laughs> um, <laughs> we're also kind of flying on this broadcast at like the seat of our pants, just trying to put things together. So thanks a lot for humoring me and coming along. Thanks for having me. I have to say, I was slightly upset that I'd seen that you put this green screen up in your office, and I was expecting to be up against that because I don't think I've ever done green screen before. But instead, I quite like this sort of BBC News sort of like newsroom setup where we can see the students in the background. Um, mm -hmm. Oh no, yeah, I like this setup, right? Like, um, look at look at all the scholarship and hard work going on back there. Um, gosh, they're just so smart and talented wait why are they all a bunch of them are seated away outside the camera view i guess they don't want to be on camera which is fine which is understandable it's okay um but anyway but now they're looking at me because they're watching this stream as i point at them anyway um okay um so marie um, you're giving us a lovely lecture series talk tonight about uh, all your work, all the important stuff you do. Um, so tell us first, I guess, a little bit about game curation. What does game curation mean to you? What does it mean to me? Um, so I, oh, I can hold the mic. Um, so yeah, so I work as a playful curator. 
And um, I guess predominantly what that means for me is being somebody who thinks about what it means to put video games and game design into um, a public context. Um, I think curation can have like a whole host of different meanings that we can think about that in terms of collections curators or sort of archivists and historians. But for me, this sort of aspect of curation I really focus on is specifically sort of exhibition and display and interpretation. Um, yeah. Um, you can interview me now. Um, what? Um, define uh, interpretation. What do you mean by interpretation <laughs> here? Oh, wait, is that big? Is that a big thing? Is that big? No, 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 no. That's not a big. I mean, all of this is a big question. Like, what does curation mean to me when? I'm um, somebody who at the moment is in the middle of a research fellowship and trying to really, as somebody who doesn't come from a formal background of curation that um, I've gone through, oh, I guess I don't consider myself having come from a formal background that I feel like I've always gone in at the deep end and gone into sort of things back to front in a sense that now's a period of time when after um, working on a V&A exhibition and working as part of Old Rumpus that I'm now doing a fellowship which is really trying to bed a lot of my understanding of games curation into theory and practice and finding out what other people sort of think and approach and so my brain's sort of a little bit exploded at the moment and I'm just trying to pull the sort of pieces of that stuff back together but um but in terms of what interpretation means that um for me that's um really thinking about the way uh, that you communicate or what narrative or story you're presenting about a specific object or work within a public space. So when you're bringing a game in, it's thinking, normally we think of interpretation as being um, sort of quite reduced down to sort of the, the uh, text that you might have alongside an object. So the reason why I've got Robert Yang on display is all encapsulated in this little interpretation label that is going to sort of explain it, whereas um, interpretation can actually be much sort of broader than that, that it can be sort of the way that an object's displayed. It could be sort of the way the object manifests in um, a space. So yeah, it's kind of interpretation, sort of how you're communicating why you're exhibiting or what it is that um, you're looking to present about a work or some of the background or context to it. Um, you mentioned uh, stuff with Wild Rumpus and stuff. So uh, we actually have this stuff on screen a little bit, right? Or look down there. There's a photograph. Uh, so uh, tell us about that photograph. Where are the viewers seeing? <laughs> and how's that? Big leaf. <laughs> Big leaf. Big leaf. Um, so this is a photograph of um, of is that one? Is that the photo? That, is this the photo that's up at the moment, or is it that one? This one. Okay. So there we go. So this is so yeah the practice or the space that um or the curation work that I was doing before my time at the V&A was part of a UK based collective called Wild Rumpus and Wild Rumpus is uh, a collective of six people and it was really born out of a desire to create different sort of playful spaces um to exhibit sort of alternative and independent video game design this particular picture is of something that uh of an event that we do at GDC each year which is called mild rumpus so wild rumpus this is mild rumpus that we put the wild mild, <laughs> mild. no wild. no what like mild can be nice and just sort of oh. relaxing not depressing oh. like wild mi mild wild yeah. Right. Anyway, it's it's we, we we're very smart. Or in the fact that we realized that if we turn the W website down, it said something else. Um, so <laughs> I never that. Oh my God. we talked about other rumpuses that we can do with uh, words that rhyme. So we talked about child rumpus, uh, a rumpus for uh, pr primarily for children. We talked about tiled rumpus, a world rumpus that would wipe clean very easily. Um, but anyway, yeah. So the picture that we're looking at is mild rumpus, and this is a space where we showcase sort of alternative and independent works at GDC each year, and it's supposed to be, I guess, sort of like a contrast to um, the sort of mood or tone of being at a convention, um, and just being, as we sort of term it, sometimes the acceptable place to nap at GDC. Um, but this particular picture as well has a picture of, um, you can see a group of developers sat in a giant sort of heart-shaped leaf in the middle, which was this giant metal leaf, which was, oh my goodness, a story within itself of how, um, oh God, and the way that they designed the Moscone, I don't know if we've got time to open up how hard it was to get that leaf onto the show floor because there are no doors going from the loading bay to the front of uh, the Moscone to be able to fit that leaf through. So instead, it had to come down this giant escalator with about 30 staff sort of marching it down and we're all just sort of observing it, praying that they don't chop it and kill a lot of people. But they didn't and it survived and um, yeah. So that's that picture. Oh my God, that's an angel. <laughs> Wait, and okay, uh, enough about the leaf. Uh, Mulan, 
Um, That's oh. a book. Oh. And then tell us about what we're seeing. What's this, <laughs> this lovely, amazing book we're looking at? So this uh, publication is uh, the exhibition catalog for the exhibition that uh, I uh, curated uh, at the V&A last year. So this is a lovely exhibition catalog which had a whole variety of essays by wonderful authors and games designers, uh, yours truly included. Um, so it was, it's a publication that was bringing together a series of articles and writings from um, different uh, authors focusing on games that were in the exhibition and people sort of talking about them and presenting them from, um, from the perspective of how we viewed them within the exhibition. The publication design um, was art directed by the wonderful Darren Wall and designed by uh, the, the wonderful Rachel Dalton, who um, Darren Wall runs Read Only Memory, which uh, they do some wonderful sort of video game publications. So if you're interested in finding really good sort of publications on video games that are really beautifully designed, then I should definitely look at uh, Read Only Memory and their work. These images are going to be random, by the I way. Know. I know. Robert asked me to send, like, a series of images, and so I bundled them together, and so there's a whole range of images that are going to come up in a really random order. <laughs> so this is going to be like a potluck. What's it going to be? Um, yeah, yeah, it's like a fun game, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's an exhibition, but it's from halfway through the exhibition. <laughs> Well, can so I'm assuming there's going to be. Some me to scroll through yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is it. a photograph of the exhibition. That um, that's oh, something okay. that was not at the exhibition, but that's an inspiration for the exhibition. Um, Do you want me to try to find it so that's like the exhibition goes in order? Mm, maybe we could just skip ahead a few. Okay. Like, do 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 do. But that's a good oh, okay. that's a good picture of like the exhibition. Look, it's some people installing the exhibition at the V&A. Um, I took this photograph and I was really pleased with the lighting in this photograph. Um, so I can talk a little bit so you can have some time to relax. Um, yeah, so um, if, you're not, if you didn't catch from all this conversation, uh, Marie was lead curator at Victorian Albert Video Games Exhibition. Did I say all that right? Um, and um, as lead curator, Marie um, put together a lot of this, um, all these amazing materials. Um, Unfortunately, the exhibition is like closed and gone right now, temporarily, right? Temporarily, temporarily. So it just um, it it ran at the Victorian Albert Museum from September two thousand eighteen to February two thousand nineteen. Then from April till um, until like about a week or so ago, it was at V and A Dundee. Now it's closed and it's temporarily traveling to somewhere else in the world, which um, will be revealed sort of within time. So it's not it's not dead and buried. It's just in transit. Oh, so it's a it's a surprise announcement. We'll find out soon. Oh my God. Um, so <clears throat> um, one thing uh, that I was really struck by when I visited the exhibition was just, yeah, like the whole exhibition design here um, was just so like masterfully done. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you approached designing like the kiosks and the walls and stuff? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> So the exhibition design was um, that we worked with a host of different designers for the exhibition. So um, with exhibitions, you sometimes or traditionally work with a 3D designer or an architect, and it's their responsibility to really think about sort of the um, the architecture or the sort of um, the physical makeup of the space. Uh, we also worked with a company called Squint Opera, who focus on audio visual design, but also interactive designs. So that was really um, towards sort of the digital components of the exhibition. Um, we had Julia who focus on graphics so that's two-dimensional design um, and Coda to Coda who are our sound designers so it's it's a really sort of um, collaborative uh, sort of team that you have to have so many different sort of disciplines um, coming into exhibitions but it's, it's like, like a designing game. a video game <laughs> that was actually something that um one of the one of the images that are um 2d designers used an awful lot in their presentations was um i don't know if you've ever seen it. it's a picture of a cat on a street and it's got like this single light sort of shining on it and there's sort of the caption saying um if video games have taught me anything then i know that this cat has a mission for me and so the, the, there was, a, like, it was something that for them as 2D designers and thinking about the signage and the way funny for the exhibition, that there were some considerations of, hang on a minute, video games and level design know sort of how to sort of direct people's attention. So um, that in turn sort of resulted in why um, some of our exhibition signage was illuminated because of that cat. But, um, oh, let's go back to the poster. 
<laughs> so yeah, you can see some of the signs um, that we had that um, were illuminated in the exhibition. But I think it's something interesting that um, is specific, well, not just specific to video games, but something about digital design is that um, unlike a lot of traditional um, traditional sort of exhibitions where you're dealing with um, sort of traditional standard sort of static material objects that when you're looking to design an exhibition space to um, to sort of house and exhibit those that you're normally looking to create sort of the environment that those will sit within. But when it comes to digital objects, actually you need sort of designers and you need um, you need to be working with designers, you need to be working with architects to even understand how those objects will manifest within a space. So I think when it comes to digital design and when it comes to video game design, that actually um, the design of an exhibition space and the design of the objects actually um, is something which is um, much more collaborative and that you have to work as a curator in a much more collaborative sense that for us during the, um, for myself and Christian Volsting, who was the research curator, that we worked sort of curatorially on the exhibition for about a year or so before we had our exhibition designers come in, which is normally sort of quite standard for an exhibition that it's like okay you'll spend a lot of time in um research then at the end of that you'll come out and you have a big list of objects and you know the dimensions of all the objects and you know how you want them exhibited but for this subject it's like actually we don't really know how to manifest a lot of this stuff in this space that we need that you need to work more collaborative you know collaboratively because it feels like part of the curatorial team is missing till you've got people um to work with to understand different ways of showcasing um digital objects um, yeah, and I think all that work just really paid off because I, I was just super impressed with um, the, the care taken to all the different objects. Is there a photo with some of the objects on display? And maybe, maybe. Let's scroll through and see. That's not what I was looking that was some. Those were some of the objects from um, Nintendo on the slide just before that. Oh, oh, this one. We could stop at this oh, one. This, oh, this one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually... Brackets. No brackets. Oh, that's me. oh, that's me. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Nintendo one. There we go. But that's this showcases just some of the artifacts and objects that we brought into the exhibition. Um, that the exhibition consisted of three, um, three different sort of um, exhibition spaces, um, all which had different motivations, or were trying to look at games through different lenses. So, this is a snapshot of um, some of our installation um, team, and some of our conservators and exhibition managers installing works for uh, Splatoon, which we sort of looked at the design process of Splatoon. So the first section of the exhibition was really looking at the design process and the materiality of game design. Whereas the second section, which was the image that we saw before with the sort of big illuminated cubes, um, this was, um, so this was Disruptors, the second section where we wanted to look at the social and political conversations being had sort of both about video games and through video games. And I think this section without doubt was one of the most complex to know how you exhibit that because how do you exhibit um, essentially a conversation or a discussion in a public space? And then the last two spaces, um, which I've not seen a photo of, although the one with me and my big earrings is technically in. It's a great photo. Eva. It's a great photo. This great. photo, yeah, for for the for the exhibition opening, I bought these really great earrings that I call the big buns, which are these two giant fluffy rubby, uh, bunny rabbit heads, and um, nobody actually took a good picture of me or a decent picture of me during the exhibition opening. Um, but thankfully, a week or two later, someone from the New York Times was like, we want to come in and photograph you for an article. And I was like, I'm gonna wear the earrings because if I didn't get any decent pictures of myself during the opening, then I'm gonna have them sort of go down and be sort of cemented in history in this New York Times article. And that's why I put this picture into a lot of presentations that I give, it's to get the money's worth out of the earrings, so. They're good earrings. Thanks. But yeah, so that, that, anyway, oh. the exhibition, that was the point that we were making. Um, so yeah, the, and that last, the last two spaces of the exhibition were looking at video games from the perspective of the players. So there was a big sort of massive sort of um, uh, space which was showcasing um, sort of a video of different player communities and different ways of interacting with games. Um, and the very last space, which is here, was much more of a slight DIY arcade of looking at sort of niche DIY um, video game communities and games that are sort of a spectacle and performance. So one thing I'd like to connect here is that in this last room, there's actually a lot of stuff from Baby Castles mm -hmm. in there. And Baby Castles, again, if you're not familiar, is a local DIY punk video game style gallery slash performance slash music space um, that is 
pretty much that is very near here so if you are a student here at game center you should definitely be checking out baby castles so that you can check out the stuff before the rest of the world discovers it and curates it you'll be on the bleeding edge of stuff and then you'll go to a big museum exhibition you'll be like i saw that when it was before it was boring and stuffy and in a museum <laughs> i mean or or i mean i or um I, I saw it before it was cool. <laughs> Maybe I oh, know Baby Castle is very cool all the time, though, right? Yeah, and also there's um, there's Wonderville as well, and um, Death by Audio, and other spaces in New York as well now. Um, yeah, there's just so many New York spaces. It's important for you to check out these spaces and support them, because then you can also like get involved with them as well. And then your work will be curated in a giant museum, and then people will take really awesome photos of you with your awesome earrings. You know. <laughs> um, do we want to talk about anything else here? Oh, it's repeating. Okay. Wait. So what is this one? This is not the exhibition. Um, so this is me just sending some random pictures to Robert and just being like, what are we going to talk about? So um, this is one which I'll probably talk a little bit more about this evening when I'm giving um, a lecture here at NYU. It's 7 p.m. Don't spoil it. What? No. Don't spoil no, no, no. This is, not, this is not a spoiler. This is just sort of like a, um, a teaser. Okay. I mean, a lot, of this, a lot of this is stuff that I'm going to sort of be coming back to. But, um, but, um, but this, is, um, this is an installation or a work by the artist Harun Faroqi. And it's his series Parallel, uh, Parallels 1 to 4. And it, for me, it's an installation that um, I think I find quite inspiring in terms of the way that it opens up video game design within a public space. That I think um, traditionally, one of the things that we would say that we sort of sought to do with the video game exhibition was to identify and experiment with um, new curatorial languages and different curatorial languages for video games. And and I say that sort of in contrast to the fact that a lot of exhibitions tend to focus on um, sort of the playable object as being the sort of central artifact or the key thing that you will exhibit. Um, but this display um, by Hiram Froki was something that I saw at the Whitechapel Gallery a few years ago. And it's a display where um, you aren't playing any of these games. You're sitting and watching a series of different playthroughs and different sort of videos that he's um, he's created uh, to um, sort of to just sort of show some of the different play styles that he took with those games. And there's um, there's four different sort of screens here and four different sort of um, installations. But for some of those, some of the things that he's doing is say playing a game like um, L.A. Noir, but he's playing it in this very intentional way where he's sort of pushing the NPCs um, behavior in a certain way, or he's trying to travel in a certain direction, but pushing up against the boundaries that the, the sort of invisible boundaries that the games have put in place to prevent him from sort of traveling in one direction. And so it's this very intentional, very directed play style of those games. And for me, in terms of what that does as an exhibition, that to me that communicated game design and showed the materiality of those games in a way that actually many exhibitions where they've given me the chance to sort of get hands on those works have not managed to do. So for me, the thing that I love about this work, and it's something that um, I think about a lot with sort of curation and thinking about what it means to put, um, to try and bring or to try and interpret game design or video games in public spaces is thinking actually we need to think beyond just the playable work we need to think of different styles and different ways of approaching that and um well this is obviously the work of an artist that for me this is sort of an area that i'm really interested in exploring as a curator with this really intentional or really directed sort of play styles and how that yeah how that can sort of open up the materiality of video games as an object so this is super interesting to me because i think uh, what's happening a lot in games right now is a lot of focus on like performance, right? A lot of stuff going on in Twitch, hello, but um, also stuff like like the uh, the uh, GTA Deer Cam, right? Um, or like Ian Chang, right? There's a lot of stuff about uh, procedure and performance and trying to like expose how a performer or something like moves through the space. So. Um, this seems like a really interesting like parallel to a lot of the stuff going on outside of games or outside of the art world, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, and this is sort of, and not wanting to talk too much about what I'll talk about this evening, yeah. but this is sort of when my brain sort of is beginning to sort of explode a little bit and it'll become a little bit sort of, um, sometimes feel a little bit sort of untethered because for me sort of with a lot of the research that I've been doing, it has sort of 
really pushed me to step back from video games and also step back from exhibitions and sort of try to strip away my assumptions and my impressions of what these actually are as um, what, what our assumptions are of these spaces uh, on, of different works and think actually what does this um, what actually is a video game as an object and one of the things that I'm really interested in exploring is this idea of video games as performance that we focus so much sort of on the materiality and the variables of video games as an object and in curation a lot of the conversations at the moment from larger institutions are focused on this emulation and this preservation of a video game as a playable work. But I think the thing that that sometimes has the ability to undermine or to perhaps sort of ignore is thinking that no two people will play a video game in the same way. No two people will experience that game as the same design artifact or the same design object that actually um, a video game is not sort of, um, and then there is not just one performance of a video game, there's almost infinite performances that you can take with that object. And so when we're thinking about preserving a game and we're thinking about preserving that sort of, um, that sort of perhaps sort of slightly tangible artifact, it's like, yeah, but actually what else is it that we should be considering when we're considering the variables of the object, but we need to think of the variables of the players and sort of the time within which you're playing and the context within which you're playing. And I think that for me is what um, this sort of Harun Faraki work sort of really gets at is thinking of games as performance and that this is, a capture of one single performance and a very intentional performance which shows one different aspect of that game in a way that actually um yeah that sort of potentially having um your hands on a controller might not and it's stuff that again sort of people like brenda laurel talk about this idea of computers as theater and it's thinking actually how does this how does that apply to games and also as curators um how does that potentially begin to open up our perspective of what it is that we're actually focusing on exhibiting and how we might exhibit that Oh my God, so many questions. Um, amazing, amazing. Um, okay, I won't keep pushing you to spoil your talk or tease your talk too much. Um, so uh, maybe now is a good time to move on to um, another thing that uh, we want to do here at Game Center Live is, in addition to hosting amazing special guests and stuff, is we also want to like bring it back to just general like Twitch Let's Play culture and stuff. So um, one fun thing that I thought, or at least I thought it would be fun, was if every special guest could choose a game that they would like to play on stream, and then we can like hang out and play it so that they're not under pressure to like explain their career and research and stuff. It's just at a point where I'm just sort of opening up sort of my whole sort of area of thinking about what does game curation mean? And so being sat asked that question, it's like, I feel like I just want to stare at the camera for half an hour and just sort of like have a bit of a breakdown. But um, yeah, so playing's much better. I mean, you did that without the breakdown and it was lovely and extremely lucid and I'm sure our students got a lot out of it. Um, but um, do you want to intro what this game is? That while I switch over to it? I didn't prepare an intro, but this is... Um, yeah, just talk about it. This is a video game by Richard Hogg and Haggett. That's Richard Hogg and Ricky Haggett uh, from uh, oh, Hollow Ponds. And this is a game of um, storing things and organizing things. This is Walmart's Warehouse, in which we play as a small... Hold White on, for a few cube. Minutes. There's some logos coming up on the screen. Yeah, we play as a small white cube, and we're going to put things into a warehouse. And every now and again, people are going to come into that warehouse, and they're going to want to get things from us. And so we're going to have organized the warehouse to be able to bring those objects to those people. Um, one of the things that I really like about this game is, um, obviously, I'm very good friends with Richard Hogg and Ricky Hackett, that they are also both people who are part of Wild Rumpus, the games collective that um, I'm in. And also, you had a article on the screen about Parliament before that said it was written by Alice O'Connor, oh, yeah. uh, who is also another member of Wild Rumpus. So, like, I'm glad that we've got um, good representation of different Rumpus people today. cross-Atlantic relations, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, and so these are uh, two good friends from World Rumpus who made these, who uh, collaborated to make this game. And one of the things that I love about this is that is Walmart's face, um, sort of the two little eyes and the um, the nose and the mouth, which is the ASCII face that if Dick ever put a ASCII into or a little ASCII face into a um, text. That's what he would. That's what he would put in. So I'm so like, oh, cute. look, it's like getting a text message from Dick. 
Oh, look. Thank you. Fun. Warehouse training. Move the banana to the banana square. What's a banana spot? We can't see my cursor. Hold on. He's just doing it invisibly. Um, did you want to play it? Or did you want to talk about it? Just commentate? Ah, oh, see, I was hoping that we'd be able to play co-op, but um, you play for a little bit. I Wait, mean, I've you, been playing. Oh, play co -op, but then, who's holding the mic? How can we play co? -op? We have to play co-op down here, or? Um, I have a controller. I think you need a gamepad to play second player. Hmm. We can play co-op if you want. Let's play co-op. I've not had a chance to play co-op, so I was hoping that we might have a chance to, and that will also give us the opportunity to extend this from just sort of seeing Wilmot to also seeing Wilmot's um pal Wally, uh, his little co-op assistant, who Richard Hook confirmed in uh, on Twitter the other day that his name is is Wally. So, stalling whilst Robert unwinds the length of... I've been playing this on Switch as well, so I feel very confident at playing the game, but with that control interface, but I'm probably going to embarrass myself. Oh, <laughs> using so I was trying with the controller and it was really hard for me. Well, was, I'm used to using Switch or using the Switch to do it, oh, but okay. um, so either way I'm going to be... Will um, this be okay? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. fine. Let's see what the buttons do. Ooh, tea break. It's a nice big tea, Caddy. <gasps> do, do, do. Normal mode, please. Oh, who's that with the round nose? Uh, yes, I'm moving. Yeah, I'll hold the mic. I keep thinking that this should have a pocket for me to have a controller to. Or like, if we, except like here, I don't think there's any way to prop this up though. Um. I mean, oh, maybe I can just be kind of useless and dance. dance around you while you do oh, all the work. There we go. Dance to bloop. Hey. We got the banana. Oh, we have to get the horse. Wait, can we co-op together to, like, grab these horseshoes? Bloop. Bloop. What if I try to grab this? Oh, no. Uh, I'm look, look, this is what happens when Robert doesn't pull his weight. Look how much work I'm having to do here oh to move God, these horse shows. I'm these trying. are made out of metal. They're very heavy. I'm trying. Here, I'll block your way. Does, I'll block your way. Does that help? Oh, I'm sure. Let's see if this helps. Yeah, that that was a big help. Thanks. Oh, you oh, oh. pushed me out of the way, though. Yeah. Hmm. See, what happens if... Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, get up. What do the buttons do? That one. That one. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Wait, rotate it. Uh, we we need to wait a little bit before we've got that ability. Oh. You're the master here. Yeah. I haven't played much. I yeah. I. Yeah. Hats. So we're gonna put hats up here. It's for little fezzes. I think I'm doing okay for playing it. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think these are winter objects, right? I would say if I was going to, yeah, I mean, the igloo looks like it could take the shape of a hat if you wanted it to, but um, conventionally I would file that under winter, yeah. Boop. Okay. And I'm going to keep trying to rotate this even though I know that I can't rotate things yet. Okay, I'm going to get these off I did all my work, so I, <laughs> I'm going to just sit here and wait. I can't fit. Marie, help. What do I do now? I have to... Yeah, I'll just shift this guy away. Bloop. Oh, and then you can... Oh. Shove it. Okay. Just shove it. Um, oh, what a dilemma. Wait. What is it? Wait, those are both winter and hats. <gasps> what a dilemma. Um, um, well, I I feel like I'm very pro hat, so I'm trying to select all the hats. Wear this hat and put it in here. Okay. But I think we should also let's just put one in winter as well. You know, th that's good th to hedge our bets a little bit. You know, yeah. I don't know if this is good filing techniques in terms of splitting. Um, what's the Dewey Decimal system for objects in this warehouse? Does this? Um, you know, I think we'll have to invent it immediately. Bloop. It, it, yep. Okay. Um, look, I'm helping. I'm helping. <sighs> wait, wait! You just took that. Oh my god. Okay, fine. Wait, let me help. Let me help. Uh, uh, 
I'm a child. I'm sorry. Uh, One. Okay, there. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, two. Ah. Uh, We've not even got out the tutorial yet. Training. I think we're doing. Our characters oh, yeah, are yeah, yeah. smiling. That yeah. Happy watches. Okay, tutorial complete. Oh, it's split screen. <gasps> Wait, what's that? You, what? This is, we're getting a delivery at the warehouse by oh. this, I think a guy who's got a plug for a head. But what have we already got? We've got some trains, we've got some... Is that the Northern Rail yes. icon? That's, does that not mean train to you? That means, yeah, yep, that's train. I that have means... never seen these before. I've had bombs in my warehouse before. Uh, I've never had cups of tea. I've had these shapes. Oh my god. Now see, this is where it's... Wait, we, so we need to unpack these, right? We need to boop, boop, boop. put these where we can find them. Yeah, and see, this is where I don't, and this is where I'm curious to see sort of how co-op goes. That I think. Um, oh. oh, I can double click them. Oh my god, that's so useful. That having two people's um, decisions about what and how to have different filing techniques. I do have very specific um, ideas about what constitutes good filing. So. I like this. I like putting this orange thing next to this orange thing. That's red. That's not red. That's orange. That's ready orange. The 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 bomb. The yeah. background of the bomb. That's orange. It's a ready orange. Okay, but I mean, you know, they're all kind of similar, right? You know, right? Kind of rotate them. Oh, we're already <laughs> fighting. Oh gosh. How long have we got? We've got one minute twenty-seven okay. seconds left. So let's grab more of See, our inventory. I feel like having played this is the game that I've definitely played the most over this summer, and it's one that I think I've been trying to take or taking a lot of um, philosophical life lessons from. Gosh, where do I? Okay, T is cozy. Wait, are those boots or socks? Uh, they look like Wellington boots. Those are wellies. Okay. I, you can put them next to the cups of tea. So they're for rain, right? Yeah, weather. Um. So yeah, like it, it, it's cozy that yeah. way, right? I think it's kind of like, but look at the look at this mess though, because if someone's kind of come in and ask for tea, got all these Wellington boots blocking away. Ooh. Let's put them up here. There we go. But um, in, in the game that I was playing, I had, um, or the first time I was playing this, I had very specific ideas about the way that I developed sort of the system of the warehouse. And that was all fine until online there was um, a lot of people sharing the different um, sorting systems that they created for their warehouses. Oh, God, look at the mess that you're making. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Why is that bad? Well, how did it's, get to the... it's yellow and it's, what is it? it's what soap. Is thing? Yeah, the soap dispenser, but how are we going to get to that thing behind it if anybody wants it? Oh, wait. Okay, wait. What do they want? Okay. Oh. Thanks. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks. Okay, okay. so we I'm need T, a file. Where do I get files? Okay, I can get this one. Yeah. Oh, I keep hitting the wrong button. Are you getting the T? I'm the getting tea. everything at the moment. Come on. Wait, you can get everything all at once? There we go. Bloop. Oh, oh, wow. You only wanted one cricket. Sorry. Okay. I didn't do very good on stars, though. Wait, that's, that's, the, that's the majority of the stars. That's not bad. Wait, there we go. Wait, so now what do we do? Now we're getting a new delivery and we've got some new product oh. lines being added to the warehouse. So um, we've got that. What, uh... A nice pattern. Okay. Another nice pattern. Sort of red, blue, and white. Oh, thermometer. And what's that? Upside down shark fin? Mm hmm. Upside down shark. Okay. Aquatic. Back to work. But um, the, the issue that, or the, the problem that, or the, the mistake that I made was that I looked at um, different people's filing techniques and realized that other people had, oh, 
Where have I gone? I have to just watch the delivery come in. Oh my god. That I didn't have as good of filing techniques as other people. And so I foolishly tried to rework my warehouse to um, copy some of these other people who had different techniques. And it completely messed up my game because I think so much about the way that you organize your warehouse is sort of so connected to your own sort of decisions about the way in which you connect different objects. But I just felt this huge anxiety of seeing other people and seeing the way that other people work and realizing that wait, I'm not good enough and other people are better and I need to copy them. But in trying to copy people, I messed up my own warehouse and I just created more problems for myself long term. And so the big life lesson that I took away from that is that sometimes you're going to do things differently from other people and that's okay. Um, you should just embrace your way of doing things because there's more than one way of doing things. But when we're doing co-op and I'm doing things correctly and you're doing things wrong. I'm not doing it wrong. I'm, well, I'm doing what? How? I How put the files that? next to the files. Move that soap. Much better. I put the look, it's so right. Uh, uh, Wait, what's wrong? I just clicked oh. the wrong buttons now. There we go. Move this out here. Yeah. And then when they come and ask for it. How do you know they're gonna ask for that though? I do at some point. I mean I I don't know, but I'm anticipating that that might be a request in the future. Hey, I'm I'm gonna try to get more stuff. I'm I'm gonna be helpful. I'm gonna get these sharp. Seven seconds. I'm just reorganizing things. This is not. This is not me at my most efficient. I'm ready. Not want? ready. <gasps> Quick. Uh, two thermometers, two star things, two horseshoes. Oh God. Bloop, bloop. Okay. Uh, I'll get a thermometer. I'm getting a cup of tea. Two stars. Bloop, bloop. Oh, they want two thermometers. Greedy. Okay. You clock out here? Yep. Way We've got more stars. Wait, so what do stars do? Stars, uh, you get little upgrades with the stars. And also, it's just nice to earn a gold star or a white star. Well, I rarely give out positive feedback in my classes, so I wouldn't know that give feeling. Out, give out little sticky stars. Should I give out more gold stars in my classes? Maybe. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, what's coming in this month? Nope. Nope. Magnets. 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 That's a. That's like a menu button on an iPhone. Yeah, that's sort of like we're going to turn the phone off by swiping it. Yeah, right? That's the little swipey switch. Oh, oh and then a gate. A gate. Okay. Do one more round? The, the, I'm slightly anxious the fact that there is no, or at least for me, there's no discernible order in the warehouse at the moment, that everything's just put everywhere, which is just chaos. It's like a messy bedroom. But you just told me to follow my heart and... Organize it however the way I can, however way my soul. Yeah, which is fine when you're playing single player, but when we're playing co-op, then you have to do it exactly the way that. Okay, tell me what to do. We we'll just keep shoving this stuff around in a mad okay. frenzy panic. Where am I? Oh, where did we? Have we got like a? See, okay, we can start like a little nautical section. Or have you been putting boats elsewhere? Oh, sorry, upside down sharks. Okay. Where have they been going? I don't know. I don't remember. Okay, I'm gonna put I them think up put here. On the left. They're gonna go up here by the flippers. Just get stuff. Whee! Oh, excuse me. What's this? I don't know what that is. I don't care anymore. Oh, sweating a bit. Oh, excuse me. Okay, I'm gonna. Bloop, bloop, bloop. I like how the face turns to like see my mouse cursor. It's really cute. He's looking at what he's doing, he's paying attention. Oh, Where should magnets go? Uh, Next to the horseshoe? Yeah, metal things. That okay. sounds good. Oop. Wait, where are the horseshoes go? Uh, did we give all the horseshoes away? Oh, you're a vertical store, whereas I'm doing this horizontally. Maybe that's where. Okay, I'm going to leave it here. Okay, well, I've got a horseshoe here, so. Okay. This vertical sorting.
Where do we put these pants? Bloop, bloop. <laughs> I'm just gonna shove it over there like this. Oh man, wait, where do we, where will we put, okay, we're putting boots here, okay. Okay, so slippers, stone, put everything to carry. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. When we know click on <laughs> What happens if you're not ready? It's like we just sit here forever. Like, sorry, sorry guys. I mean okay, we'll just bring it back to center. Um Are we ready? We're ready. Yeah. I've just dumped a load of stuff in the middle of the aisle. Okay, they want northern rails. Um Okay, I'll get the trains. Wait, where have we put the third one? Oh, the shark fins are over here. Is it down in the boots in? get this one. We wanted it's... three shark okay. fins. Okay. We've got a lot of those shells. The milks. Did we even shelve the milks? Did you bring it up? What? Wait, no. I didn't even see any milks. Are Still you... in the goods in. This reminds me of working at a bookshop. When you look on the system, it says, yeah, there's two copies of it in stock. Oh, you're getting the milks. Okay, I'll get the cricket. Sorry, it's not on the show. I'm just going to go check the goods in. Still in goods in. This is a health and safety hazard. Look at this in a minute. Oh. 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 That was really hectic. Okay, let's see what surprises we get. Presents. Wait, we didn't get any presents? Oh, wait. No, we are. Wait, what? It's a stock take. This is a good place to end it. See, the thing that we can now purchase is the ability to rotate blocks. Oh, and okay. now we get a stock take, which is one of my favorite bits out of Walmart's warehouse, which is the calm in between um, each of the levels for the different deliveries that we've just got time to just take it easy and just organize things. Wait, is it just infinite time? Mm -hmm. So we can just hang out now? We yeah. No time? We just sort the warehouse out for each we noodle about with it and um, get really pedantic with the way that you want things organized. Oh dear. This is good. It's just like a nice little breathing space to organize your thoughts. It's so unusual for like a game to like be about being really like fast and like on the ball and then it like slows down and says, okay, now sit and have some tea and stock take. Just have some, yeah, just have a little, just organize, get yourself in order. And don't worry, we're not going to time you on that. Oh. Well, I think the main thing that I can see that's happening here is that I, I, in my warehouses, have always sorted things horizontally. So I normally sort of bring things right to the top and have lines coming out and just use this main thoroughfare to sort of bring big loads um, up, to, <laughs> up to the delivery hatch. Oh. Whereas you seem to be doing it vertically, which I wonder... I th I blame the aspect ratio of our split screen. Oh, That's yeah. making me think more vertically. Which I'm open to that. That I have no. I've seen some other people's warehouses where they've been doing that sort of storage, and it's like maybe that's more efficient. Maybe that's better. So, um, yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. So, how good am I at this game? I think you've been doing well playing one-handed um so congratulations uh do i get a gold star you got 14 gold stars or maybe we should split them if we're co-workers like we're splitting our tips so you get 17 stars you get seven stars i get seven wait 50 50 are you sure 50. you don't want more stars I want more stars felt like you were doing more of the work <laughs> i've got two hands and uh i think i've been playing this more than you fair enough um okay well that's woman's warehouse uh you should definitely play it if you haven't played it um really fun couples game you know play it with a significant other and like argue argue, argue about how you might tidy your virtual warehouse <laughs> or understand that this is a way for you to learn how to come to a consensus and to compromise in a relationship you too could take deep life lessons away from this game much as i did which was yeah, it's it's fine. Find your own path. Find your own way of organizing the warehouse. And sometimes you can look at the way that other people do things and you can adapt and change and learn from that. But don't feel that you've got to change yourself or who you fundamentally are. That you keep your warehouse you want to. We're learning so much on this stream. Isn't this wonderful? Um, 
Okay, we're right about near the end of the stream, I think. Um, no, I mean we'll we'll boot them out. I think we'll stay here, but I think we might boot them out. Um, so um, normally we do a bunch of stuff near the end of this stream, um, but our streaming computer actually like broke down, and we had to do, like really like jury rig this whole setup so um we're not going to do that this week but you know next week um stay tuned for all this cool stuff that we'll have planned and hopefully our computer won't melt down and hopefully we'll do stuff and hopefully i'll be better at wilmot's warehouse as well um last word marie goodbye <laughs> goodbye um thanks for watching and uh, if, again, if you're in the New York area, hopefully see you around at Playtest Thursday, uh, which is 5.30 to 7 p.m. tonight. Or if you um, want to catch Marie at her lecture series talk, that's 7 p.m. onwards uh, at 370 J Street on the 12th floor. Uh, make sure you RSVP on our website, though, at gamecenter.nyu.edu first so that you can ensure that you get a seat because it would be very sad if you came all this way to downtown brooklyn and you forgot to rsvp and then we don't have any room for you left that would be very sad indeed sad. so <laughs> oh gosh okay um so anyway thanks for tuning in and um please tune in next week bye bye, bye. thanks, bye. For, thanks <laughs> for having me <laughs> wait how do i turn this off okay uh okay bye for real now bye